So let's go back to a few of the things that we were learning about with radioactive decay, though. So uh, hopefully you remember me mentioning that there are four fundamental forces in the universe. So in this decreasing order of strength, we know the strongest force in the universe is the strong nuclear force. And that's what holds the nucleus of the atom together. But remember, it acts over a really short distance. It's like Velcro, where when it's like really close, it's real strong. But as soon as you move it far enough apart, uh, it just stops working. The second strongest is the electromagnetic force, which makes sense. The strong nuclear force needs to be just strong enough to overcome the electromagnetic force uh, of the protons not wanting to be beside each other. So that is why the strong nuclear force is, of course, stronger than electromagnetic force. Uh, however, electromagnetic force acts over an infinite range. So once you get those protons just far enough apart, then the electromagnetic force will take over because it acts over an infinite range, right? It doesn't matter how close they are, there's still going to be an electromagnetic force there. We just know when they're closer, there's a stronger force. All right. Uh, after that is the weak nuclear force. Um, and this is the one we're not really actually going to learn much about in Physics 30. Um, but just so you know, it has to do with neutrino interaction. Remember when um, in beta decay, when a neutron turns itself into a proton or a pro proton turns itself into a neutron, um, the weak nuclear force is an act there creating that beta positive or beta negative particle. Okay, And the weakest force of all the four fundamental forces is gravitational force, and that also acts over an infinite range. But we know that really it can be, you need really, really big masses for the gravitational force to really be at work. So um, it is definitely the weakest of the four fundamental forces. So those are our four fundamental forces. Why does this matter? <laughs> This matters because of mass energy equivalence, okay? So especially the strong force there, because if we want to remove a nucleon from a stable nucleus, we have to overcome that strong nuclear force, which is really difficult to overcome that strong nuclear force. Once it's done, it's not so bad, but overcoming it, it takes a lot of work, like a lot, a lot of work. So that is what we call the binding energy. That, that work that it takes to overcome the strong nuclear force is what we call the binding energy. So, of course, it's the energy required to separate the nucleons of the nucleus. So what's happening is the nucleus, um, it's so tightly packed together, you need to like put in a lot of energy into it. And then with that, you get free nucleons. You get a bunch of neutrons and protons. And even then, you might not get, they not, might not all be free. You might just have a few free ones. Uh, so it depends. This depends on the mass defect. And you're going, what the heck is that? Well, that's the difference in the mass between the individual nucleons and the nucleus. So think about that for a minute. Uh, the difference in mass between the individual nucleons and the nucleus. So what that basically means is if you add up the mass of all the individual nucleons, it will be more than a nucleus. So say I want to look at a helium atom, which it has, you know, two protons, we'll say protons are in red, two neutrons, which we'll say are in blue. If I just take the mass of those separately, this mass will be greater than the mass of an actual helium atom where we have two protons and two neutrons all together, okay? So that is what we call the mass defect is the fact that the mass of individual parts is not equal to um, the actual nucleus, okay? And that's why we need so much energy and we need to put in so much energy because what's happening to the mass for here? It's being converted to energy. You guys remember Einstein's mass energy equivalence means that mass can be converted to energy. Energy can be converted to mass. Okay, so some of the mass of the individual nucleons is going towards energy to keep this nucleus together. Okay. 
And to figure out how much mass is being converted to energy, we can just use Einstein's equivalence that is E equals mc squared. So if we're looking at mass defect specifically, change in energy is the um, binding energy, is the energy that is going towards keeping that nucleus together. Um, the change in mass, that's what we call the mass defect, so how much mass is being converted to energy to keep the nucleus together, or what's the difference between the individual nucleons and the nucleus. Okay, so that's how we find the, the mass defect, is we do product mass minus the reactant mass, and of course C is just the speed of light. Okay, so um, one other thing I want to point out is that um, we're going to have to use more specific values for proton and neutron mass than what are on your data sheet. So I'm giving you permission to write these on your data sheet right now. Um, and I will give these specific masses when you have um, a question where you have to calculate the mass defect. Because at this point, just using 1.67 for both of them isn't accurate enough. We need just the most accurate um, value that we can get possibly get okay so just keep in mind we're going to be using those two masses instead of the what's on your data sheet and you can write these on your data sheet I'm completely fine with that okay so just a reminder the mass of the nucleus is not equal to the mass of the individual nucleons okay so if I need you to find the mass of a helium nucleus, it doesn't mean you just take the mass of two protons and two neutrons and add them together. Okay, that is no longer what's happening and we are getting really nitpicky and down to um, some really, really precise calculations here. Okay, so uh, when I'm talking about the mass defect, let's do an example. Mass of a helium nucleus, I was just talking about that is 6.6443 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. We want to determine the binding energy of the helium nucleus. So binding energy means how much energy is going towards, or sorry, how much mass is being converted to energy to keep this helium nucleus together. So of course we know helium nucleus has two protons and two neutrons, so it has two protons and uh, four nucleons, but of course that's made up of our two protons and our two neutrons, okay? So anytime I want binding energy, I am looking for how much mass is being converted to energy to keep this together, okay? So I have the mass of the helium and I can find the mass of the two protons and two neutrons individually. Okay, because remember, mass defect is the mass of the individual nucleons minus the mass of the nucleus. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So when we're looking at change in energy is equal to change in mass times C squared, again, that delta M is mass defect. So um, if I want the binding energy, again, that is how much mass is being converted to energy. And so I just take that mass defect, multiply it by C squared, and then I have how much mass is being converted to energy. Okay, so again, the mass defect here is going to be the two protons and the two neutrons, the mass of those individually, and from that I'm gonna subtract the mass of the, the actual helium nucleus, because again, they're not the same. Okay, so uh, what do we have here? We have two protons, so proton mass was 1.6726 times 10 to the negative 27. 6726 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Okay. Uh, to that, I need to add to the, the mass of the two neutrons. So that was 1.6749 times 10 to the negative 27.
Okay, so that would be the mass of just the individual nucleons. And now from that, I have to subtract the mass of the, um, of the nucleus, which we found out was 6.6443 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Okay, so there we go. That's just delta M right there. And we need to multiply that by C squared, which I ran out of room. So I'm just going write, to write it down here. But that is times uh, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And then you got to square that. Okay, so here I would calculate the mass defect first, then multiply it by C squared, and then get your answer. So when we do that, we get 4.5630. Yeah, that's five significant digits. That's what we need. Times 10 to the negative 12 joules. Okay. So again, anytime I ask for binding energy, that's just saying, okay, how much mass is being converted to energy? What is that energy that we're getting from the mass that's being converted? And we always find the mass by finding the mass defect, meaning what is the difference between just the individual nucleons and the mass of the actual nucleus? Okay. So finally, I just want to talk about that mass defect and that mass keeping it a nucleus together and what it takes to overcome that. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about now. We're going to talk about those energy changes. So first of all, before we do that, because there is going to be an energy change there. So let's talk a little bit about energy changes and the ones that we've known so far, because this is a completely new thing, right? So you've heard of physical changes so far, right? So that's if something changes its state, um, chemical reaction, and that's a reaction that produces changes in atoms and ions and molecules, things like that. Uh, really important though, it just produces changes in molecules. It doesn't actually transmutate um, one element into another, right? That's what a chemical reaction does not do. It's just changing the atoms. It's bringing different elements together to make different molecules, okay? So really that involves electrons surrounding the nucleus because we know you can get different molecules by how the electrons bind to one another to make um, full outer energy levels. So an example of this is combustion. Um, you're not creating any new elements. It's the same basic elements going in that are coming out. They're just in different molecules, right? So when you have a hydrocarbon and oxygen go in, we get carbon dioxide and water out. Uh, so all that stuff coming out was really present. The elements were all present in the reaction first. So it's a nuclear reaction that is really going to involve the composition of the nucleus itself. Okay, so there's two types of nuclear reactions. One is fission, and that's when you split an atom, of course, fission um, think about a fissure. A fissure is when something has a break in it. So fission means it's breaking apart or it's splitting. And then we have fusion, and that is when you combine uh, two elements together to make a new element. And this releases the most energy. It releases a ton of energy, but the problem is right now it takes more energy to make fusion happen than it does to that we get out of it. So at this point, it's still not um, a good form of energy. But fission is, we do use nuclear fission um, in power plants to get some energy. So it is a really great way of getting energy. And if we can make fusion happen um, in a way that we're not putting in so much energy that we don't even get as much out then it'll be great as well. But this is what our sun does, is fusion. Um, it's constantly doing it. And of course, the, the surface of the sun is so hot, so it can do this. And that's the reason why it takes more energy put in, because you have to make things so hot in order for it to actually happen. And so um, with fusion, with our sun, it's taking two hydrogen atoms and making helium. Um, and that's what our sun's doing all the time is, is nuclear fusion. So when we make fission or fusion happen, this is called artificial transmutation. So one example is when a parent nucleus is 
bombarded with another particle and it causes transmutation. So when you uh, take one element and you bombard it with another proton, trying to make that proton stick, um, then you are creating a new element. And if, so, of course, all elements beyond uranium are created artificially, right? They're created in, in a lab. They're not something that we can find in nature. So let's just do one quick example of a de decay equation. So we want to write the decay equation for the bombardment of nitrogen-14 with a single alpha particle to produce hydrogen-1 and an unknown particle. Okay, so we have nitrogen-14. I don't have a um, periodic table with me right now, so hopefully you have one close by. But nitrogen has an atomic number of 7, and of course there's 14 nucleons. And it's being bombarded with a single alpha particle. Okay, so remember alpha particle is just helium, where you have 4 nucleons and 2 uh, protons. Okay, and so what's going to happen is it's producing a hydrogen 1 atom and an unknown particle. Okay, well, we can figure this out. So remember, we need conservation of charge. We need conservation of nucleons. So 7 plus 2 is 9. So since the la left side is equal to 9, we also need the right side equaling to 9. So we need something with a, an atomic number of 8 because 8 plus 1 will equal to 9. What has the atomic number of 8? Oh, that's oxygen. Okay. And then again, conservation of nucleons. So we have 14 plus 4 on this side. That's 18. So 1 plus 17 will be 18. So we're creating oxygen 17 in this situation. Okay. So that is one way to artificially create um, a new element. Obviously here oxygen isn't a new element, but that's just an example for you. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about fission and fusion, specifically fission. All right, so with nuclear fission, energy is released when a heavy nucleus is split apart because, again, so much energy is needed to keep that nucleus together that it would rather just split apart. So you bombard it with something, and it's just going to split apart, and it's going to give off energy. Um, and, of course, the mass of the original nucleus is then greater than the masses of the fission fragments. So this is kind of like binding area, binding energy, but slightly different. Right? So that was more just specifically a, a nucleus is together. Um, what's the difference between its individual nucleons and its, um, its nucleus? Here, when we have one nucleus, that mass is actually greater than the masses of fission fragments. So this is actually um, different because when you have fission, you have energy being let off because you are forcing this nucleus apart. Okay? So what's going to happen is if I have a large nuclei that undergoes fission, then we have two small nucleuses plus a bunch of energy being let off. Okay. Now, the thing about nuclear fission is, and why it can be so dangerous, because this is, this is, you know, when you hear of a nuclear bomb, this is what's happening. It's fission. Um, so why can it be so dangerous? Well, it's self-perpetuating. So what you need is you need neutrons to, to require to start a reaction, and then neutrons are given off from there. Okay, so we have one itty-bitty neutron going in here to a uranium atom, and it's um, bombarding it, and then, of course, it breaks off into two new elements. But what happens is we get three more neutrons there that bombard um, three other nuclei in the sample, which then creates three per um, new fission, and that's then nine. And then, of course, the next would go to, oh goodness, would go to 27. Uh, so it really gets out of hand super duper fast and that's why it can be such a violent reaction because it's this big chain reaction that happens in virtually no time and uh, then it causes an explosion because it's just giving off so much energy. So spontaneous fission can occur for very heavy elements um, but their energy of equivalence of like their mass defect it, that can just be observed as an increase in the system's kinetic energy. Okay, but just a note here, alpha and beta decay are not fission 
reactions, okay? Remember, alpha and beta decay are just when it lets off something small. And we're talking about, when we talk about fission, really we have two smaller nuclei, but they're more equal. But with alpha and beta decay, the nucleus is still much greater than that alpha particle or that beta particle. Okay, so those are not fission reactions. So the energy release with fission is nearly instantaneous, which again, like I said, why is why a um, atomic bomb can be so dangerous because it's an uncontrolled fission chain reaction, okay? And it's just too much energy and it happens all at once. But we can still harness this energy and this is where nuclear reactors come in, right? Because that they have found a way to control that fission and control that chain reaction and make it happen much slower so then we can take the energy in doses that we can actually handle and um, then use it, okay? So we do have somewhere in Canada that does this, this is can do and Canadian deuterium uranium. Um, so yeah, well, that, there you go. Let's quickly talk about nuclear fusion. Uh, so energy is released when small light nuclei fuse together because again, they lose some of their mass um, and that's converted to energy. And so energy is given off. So of course, when we have two smaller nucleus nuclei, then they uh, come together to form a really large nuclei and uh, a bunch of energy and of course this is what our sun is doing that's why our sun gives off so much energy because it is constantly just having nuclear fusion happen on the sun so there you go But of course, the reason it takes so much energy to make nuclear fusion happen is because you have to overcome the electric re repulsion by colliding nuclei at super duper high speeds and really, really, really high temperatures. Okay, these are called thermonuclear reactions. And so it's really difficult for us to create an atmosphere like the sun that's so hot that's going to help this ha uh, happen, right? Okay, so here's actually what's going on in the sun. It's not just, just as simple as two hydrogen atoms because that wouldn't just be able to make um, one helium atom because a helium does have two neutrons as well. So we need four hydrogen atoms and then two of those protons are going to turn themselves into neutrons. Um, so it's kind of a form of beta decay, but then it's a few different things at the same time. And then, of course, we have a lot, a lot of energy given off in the form of gamma radiation. Uh, so nuclear fusion is just, is it definitely a killer, but it gives off a ton of energy. And if we can harness that, then that would be absolutely fantastic. Okay, and there we go. So again, let's talk about this mass energy equivalence. It's not the same as mass defect, but it's calculated in the same way, kind of, ish. Okay, so really important to note. Okay, so if we find the change in mass, so remember that's always the mass of the products minus the mass of the reactants. So if we find that change in mass and that's negative, that means that the change in energy is negative, that's just telling you the energy is being given off, okay? And if that change in mass, remember, mass of the products minus mass of the reactants, if that's positive, it means energy is being put into the system, so that is binding energy, okay? So that is the difference between binding energy um, and something where a nuclear reaction is happening, okay? And that's what we need to note. All right, one more example, and then I promise I'm done talking. Uh, so we want to determine the energy released in the fission, fission reaction below, and then it gives us all these atomic masses. It gives us the mass of the neutron. So uh, there we go. So we got that. So again, I want to know the energy released. So we still just need change in mass. And change in mass, remember, is always going to be the mass of the products minus the mass of the reactants. 
So these are our products. These are our reactants. Okay? And so that's still something that's called our mass defect, is what's the difference between the mass of the products and the mass of the reactants. Okay, so I'm gonna to need to go onto a new page here in order to figure that out. But let's do that. Let's figure out how much mass is lost and therefore how much energy is given off. So this change in mass. So again, what were the products? We have uh, barium, we have krypton, and we have three neutrons, okay? So we need the individual masses of all those. So barium here is 2.3399 times 10 to the negative 25, okay? Three three nine nine times ten to the negative twenty five kilograms. To that, we're going to add krypton, which is one point five two six four times ten to the negative twenty five kilograms. And then we have three neutrons, so it's three times one point six seven times four nine times ten to the negative twenty seven. Okay, so now I'm gonna take all that, and from that I'm gonna subtract the mass of the reactants, which is uranium and one neutron. Okay, so uranium, we have 3.9029 times 10 to the negative 25 kilograms. Okay, and then that we need the, the mass of a neutron, 1.6749 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Okay, and then what do we get all together for our mass defect? We get negative 3.102 times 10 to the negative 28 kilograms. Okay, so there we go. Negative mass means energy has been given off. Energy has been released. So if I wanna know how much energy is released, then of course, I just use Einstein's mass energy equivalence. Okay, so that's gonna equal that negative 3.102 times 10 to the negative 28 kilograms times C squared. And that gives us a change in energy of negative 2.7918 times 10 to the negative 11 joules. Okay, so there we go. There's mass defect for you, that's change in energy, that's energy being given off by a fission reaction. Okay, so just remember mass of products minus mass of reactants, um, and just know the difference between binding energy and energy being given off in a fission reaction, and they are different, okay? That's it for me today, you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll talk to you later.